Ralph here once again, and please forgive me, but I have to start with this because this is just so endearing. This is a different way of using the nature around you. In this case, we will consider it service animals in order to detect COVID-19. Now, this is a proof of concept study. Now, we're all familiar with the studies reference to dogs sniffing out cancer, determining uh, a person or determining predicting when the individual may have a seizure or something along those lines ahead of time uh, through heightened awareness. Now, this just plays into that. The animals or dogs, I should say, may be able to sniff out those who are showing symptomatic COVID-19 or disease known as a result of SARS-CoV-2 in a very, very subtle, gentle way. I love this. If you read on the road here, uh, road on the wall here, diagnose. That's just a wonderful, wonderful play on words. All right, we're going to get into data analytics in a second. Let's look at the study first. Can the detection dog alert on COVID-19 positive persons by sniffing auxiliary sweat samples proof of concept study? Looked at 177 individuals. The results were as follows. The dog and the handler were both blinded to the COVID-19 positive sample location. Important. Now, keep in mind, it's also kind of cute. You imagine the setting that they're in, dealing with animals. Uh, there was some confounding, but they thought they could have a higher detection rate if horses weren't going by or people weren't making a lot of room and a noise in the next room. But keep that in mind, proceed. So this will be ready for future studies to go into a more clinical setting. And what a wonderful, wonderful way of being able to detect disease in a very disarming way through a service animal per se. The success rate ranged from 76 to 100 percent. The confidence interval was there. These results provide some evidence that detection dogs may be able to discriminate between sweat samples from symptomatic COVID-19 individuals and those from asymptomatic COVID-19 individuals. However, due to limitations of the proof of concept study, including some COVID samples, uh, more than once been confounding biases, these results may uh, be confirmed in validation studies. So instead of going to your place of employment or whatever it is, you have Max or Christy, the pet German Shepherd or whatever, and it's your corporate animal at the same time too. It's just making sure everyone's well. Beautiful, beautiful study. I hope it works out, again, without incorporating my own bias, but still, really nice. Now to more serious articles as we proceed. Conflict of interest in reference to this British Medical Journal among UK government's COVID-19 advisors, which are not transparent. The reason it's important, because remember back in SARS-CoV-1, the World Health Organization had a major corruption scandal declaring a pandemic when there wasn't a pandemic. Uh, and there was a mass amount of financial uh, conflict of interest that was not exposed. Well, we have the same thing occurring here, but this case in localized government. And the read through, uh, COG spokesman confirmed the SAGE members must declare the financial conflicts of interest and provided by the British Medical Journal a copy of the disclosure which the BMJ has made available to the public. But they declined to provide members to sign disclosures and they were looking at uh, options to make these declarations public while complying with relevant data protection legislation. The BMJ is now seeking financial disclosure, da da da. Citizens must be able to trust. The advice of professional scientific advisors, we need transparency. Here is the problem. In many cases, the US government lacked, UK government, apologize, lack of financial transparency in tackling COVID 19 has resulted in negative headlines. For example, the chief scientific advisor had stock in the company, which was we're obviously working on a vaccine deal, and so on and so forth down the line. I'll have a link for you to be able to follow that. Uh, research or disclosures from the British Medical Journal into the lack of financial disclosures in reference to mandating certain vaccine research or vaccine contracts, which ties into our next COVID story, um, or I should say SARS-CoV-2. Uh, many of you may already be familiar from this article that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association. And the nursing research experience in a COVID-19 vaccine trial. Now, keep in mind, this made it to the JAMA. But however, though, we're not aware of this person, either in the placebo aspect or they're actually on the actual vaccine. So I want to 
predicate that first, but still just the same as compelling because of some of the statements that were made. Obviously, the individual, uh, people don't, from the, the RNA vaccine, a microRNA vaccine, it's not the first injection, it's the second injection where the problems seem to arise in actual vaccine administration. Again, with the trials, you don't know who's placebo, who's not. So that's the caveat. By the end of the day, da da da, we know all the symptoms. When I woke up at 5.30 a.m., quoting obviously, I felt hot burning, I took my temperature and looked at the reading of 104.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, yeah, you could be thinking, well, if, and this is a big if, if this is the vaccine, that's a pretty massive side effect. A lot of the elderly, by the time they take the second shot, uh, are gonna call certain elements into question. Right now, a lot of people have taken the first shot, the second shot is the issue. I called to report my reaction to the injection. Thankfully, my fever had gone down to 102. Uh, quote, the research nurse said, quote, a lot of people have reactions after the second injection. So we'll have links to this statement as well. It doesn't hold much weight from a data aspect if it was not knowing who is the placebo and who's the actual vaccine individual. But the fact is it made it to the Journal of American Medical Association. So it has some validity of potential side effects in which to look out for. And that leads to the next question. There is not just one type of vaccine, and this is important for people to know. There are actually four types of vaccines being out there right now, being researched. So if you look at here, and this is from the Vaccine Alliance, what we're looking at here, is whole virus, protein, subunit, nucleic, and viral vector. Now, I'm not going to predicate or bias any individual per se. If you had to choose, if you were forced to take a vaccine, it was mandatory, you had to travel someplace, which one of these four would you choose? Now, to me personally, uh, if I was, it was mandatory and I had no choice, I probably go on the side of the old school variolation type thing or whole virus. The microRNA may be very effective in the future. However, though, looking at potential conflicts of interest and basically certain reactions, I would probably err more on the side of caution due to the fact that, however, so far, no DNA or RNA vaccines have been licensed for human use. And this is a first. Now, microRNA uh, vaccines are actually being researched very effectively in reference to cancer trials and you know certain things along those lines and fighting cancer and so on and so forth. So it doesn't mean it doesn't have a spot in the future. But right now, I, I have my reservations, so chances are this will probably be the least expensive and the easiest to administer in a mass scale, uh, but for those few individuals which are watching this channel, keep in mind other vaccine types are coming out, and even though this may result in some viral shedding uh, using a whole virus if it's dead and inact inactivated as opposed to a live virus, uh, then it may hold the best promise of these four if forced to, just to keep in mind. All right, now we're going to go into the data research as we proceed, and we are going to start off with correlations. Now, the data we're going to be pulling from is from the Health and Human Services, and so we're going to be first looking at the a new data element. We're looking at occupancy beds hospital-wise, and so this is where the data is drawn. And also, before we proceed to just keep in mind, this is the average hospital uh, occupancy rate. All right, so if you keep that in mind, that's what it is per year. Now, this is one way of looking at the data on a bar chart. If I want to change a person's view or impression, I could take the exact same data and make it look like this. Even though this looks more dramatic, they are both the same numbers. For those not familiar with data analytics, Data visualization is a very, very, very powerful propaganda tool. You could take the exact same data and give two totally different impressions to the viewer. So keep that in mind. Try to always focus on the numbers 
as opposed to variations in line. All right, so what we'll be looking at this is this information here. And also, too, keep in mind as well, a lot of people have forgotten that basically in 2017, 2018, if I read you the headline, uh, asking staff to work overtime, setting up triage tents, restricting friends and family visits, and cancel elective surgeries. People forget that was 2017, 2018 influenza. Hospitals overwhelmed by mass influx, da da da. Face war zone of flu patients. This is, again, look at the dates, 2018. So, again, this, this is nothing new. Hospitals filling up is not something which is new to SARS CoV 2 or for those others, COVID 19. So, this is not an uncommon headline. It's just now the way it's packaged now under a state of emergency, it's, it changes the impression. So let us go right into the data analytics and begin. Now, here we go. Oh, I want to point one more thing too. Let me go to, let's go to do, 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 investigate correlations. Check this out. Now we're going into the data science. For those not familiar with this aspect, let me just close this part out. Uh, this may bore a few of you, but for those which are into research, this is quite intriguing. Let's check this out. This is the world of all the different things that you, from extreme poverty, GDP, uh, age, so on and so forth. Here's the one, the one uh, interesting correlation that you'll see. The stringency index, and we're not talking a negative correlation, we're talking a positive correlation. So focus on that. Stringency index two total deaths per million now strings the index and life expectancy obviously and we go down here strings the index and total deaths per million strings the index and total deaths per million 0.71 case per million 0.66 so that's really a really strong correlation uh oh this is interesting too female smokers age 70 or older 0.77 uh that's like that. I'd love to see some epidemiology in, in reference to, but we're talking SARS CoV 2. So, what we're looking at here is the stringency index having some sort of correlation. Now, most likely it's through testing and things along those lines. So I don't want to necessarily imply confounding. But, however, though, the harder they lock down the populations from a very basic standpoint, the stronger the correlation between deaths per million. Again, confounding can be weeded through there. They can be messing with the data. It could be better testing, better diagnosis, so on and so forth. But still, regardless, that's even if you try to justify it, that's still incorporating a bias until you actually have the opportunity to research it. All right, let's go to the hospitals. Hospitals occupancy. Ready? Here we go. Ba -ba -ba. All right, getting there. Did I tell you what that is? There's the API from the Health and Human Services. You're hearing all these things in the news in reference to hospitals being overwhelmed, but I showed you the article before. This is nothing new. Uh, and But however, though, now in the atmosphere of this constant panic mode, it's it seems to hold precedent. Even though people barely remember the headlines uh, from a couple of years ago, when they're almost the exact same headlines. So I'm not going to do the argument of whether influenza is worse or COVID is worse or SARS-CoV-2. I'm getting into the basically psychological aspect, the behavioral modification, where we've experienced this before, but somehow back then we didn't remember it. Now we hear it on a daily basis. All right, here we are. This is basically total inpatient beds. Now there's one bit of data that's missing from this too. I see the ICU beds. All right, which is important. This is from the Health and Human Services. The percentage of ICU beds being utilized, all right? But I don't see the percentage of ICU beds being utilized by COVID patients. Inpatient beds overall, but not by COVID patients. That part kind of disturbs me just a little bit, and this data was last updated on December 9th from reporting. But just to give you an idea, actually it's now December 13th. Let's give it a quick run through, see if it pops up. Nope, still the same data. All right, so here we are. Total inpatient beds is blue. Inpatient beds estimate uh, used is an orange. You see California there. The green is the inpatient beds being used by COVID patients. You see how that kind of changes the perspective uh, just a little bit? 
I mean, of course, you have to remember that a lot of this is elective surgeries, surgeries. People get sick from other things besides SARS-CoV-2, even though you don't hear it in the, in the news. You have cancer patients. You have a lot of people that going through a lot of hardships, heart disease, diabetes complications, so on and so forth. So not all the beds in the hospital are being filled by COVID patients, even though it's a very, very healthy, I mean, not healthy amount. That's a wrong way of putting it. Please forgive me. A very, very large amount. I was about to use the word respectable, and that's not a way of putting it either. But you see what I mean. Now look at this way here, total ICU beds. ICU beds used estimate. All right, here we are. So this is, of course, the whole state now looking at particular areas. Like, for example, Newsom has his state of emergency, lockdowns, da, 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 uh, based upon, you know, ICU beds being used as a percentage per community. So that kind of skews it because, you know, let's say, for example, you're in San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County is two miles away. You could just transfer a patient. Now, that's not obviously a, uh, an equitable option in many cases, but still, you know, you got to look maybe at radiuses as opposed to county lines. That'd be a smarter way of doing it, but I don't expect that. So let's look at this way here. Uh, boom, 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 down the line. Yeah, we're locking down counties. Think about that. We're locking down counties when it actually reality, I know it's more difficult, but you should be looking at uh, radiuses, you know, so forth, so forth and so forth. Alaska, barely making the, the uh, chart there, so on and so forth. The next chart. All right, now keep in mind, when we looked at the data on, on what the average hospital occupancy rate is for beds, all right, we're looking between 68 and 76 percent, and I'm being unfair here by marking it up to 76 or 76 percent. So this red line is the average amount at any one time of the year that the hospital occupancy rate for beds is. So again, this changes the perspective. And now you look at the news research article we looked at before, for example, and we're just People go in triage tents and so on and so forth. I mean, with SARS-CoV-2, we don't even have that happening now. But still, not to say, you know, because someone, something like that's not happening, that's not important. But here we are. And let's just, shoot, let's just uh, for fairness, let's move this down to a 68. And run that chart again. All right. So there you are. I was looking about above average. So we're going to say 68, for example. We'll, we'll, we'll take everything from 1990 forward. Even though the irony is there's actually less hospitals now than there was back then. So if you look at the data, it's actually kind of intriguing that we're actually reducing the number of hospitals, even though we have a higher elderly population and a higher population with comorbidities, we actually have less hospitals. But now keep in mind too, the ICU beds, in all fairness to those concerned, it's more than just the beds, it's the people that can actually watch those beds and help those individuals in ICU or those hospital beds themselves. So there could be a manpower shortage. Remember in the first part of the COVID, uh, actually now it's still going on, when they pulled kids out of school and had in-home learning, that actually hamstrung one-third of the frontline healthcare force. So here we are again, we're pulling kids out of school back to online learning but you know healthcare workers have children too they have to take care of so it pulls people off the front line so you have tons of available beds just no one to man them all right and now we go back into the regular data analytics i'll run the real fast since we're not really covering a lot of new stuff so let's go to do 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 let's go to the world mask aspect right off the bat all right do 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 and i'm going to run to the real the top now what we're doing here for those not familiar is we're trying to determine whether masks are making any difference correlation wise in COVID-19. So I wanna run through the data and you can make your own rational judgment. Don't worry about that. Those that see this video for the first time, that's not the data we're looking at. Just think of it this way, it's kind of like me showing my homework. All right, we're looking at these columns, facial coverings, death per million, total deaths, so on and so forth. All right, and depending on the last data reporting time. All right, here we go. This is the data as of now. So here we are. Finland's at a one. What this means is this. Zero means no mass policy. 
There's Sweden, Nicaragua, Palestine, Vanuatu, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, so on and so forth. One is a recommended. All right, for example, here we are, and you see Japan is a one. People think often in a lot of the Asian countries that it's a four. Now, there may be cultural aspirations to wear a mask, but is it mandatory? Not necessarily. Russia is a two. Germany, Iceland, Chile, United Kingdom is a two. These are all twos. And let's go up to the fours here. Boom. Now, the reason being here is everyone's going to have an example of a country that has no mask policy in countries that have a four mask policy. And there are going to be positive and negatives. The trick is not to use those those high numbers or low numbers to rationalize your judgment call. The objective is to see if mask wearing has any correlation with basically uh, COVID-19, I'm saying SARS-CoV-2, uh, rates or so on and so forth. So here we go, down the line. Let's look at it real fast. United States, mass level four, deaths per million. All right, there we are. Now we're just going mass level four, looking at cases per million. Now you tell me, does it have a relationship or not? Uh, United States, test per thousand. This is the biggest relationship that probably in this chart, is the test per thousand, the case per million. Now number two, I broke it up to test per thousand, case per million, because Oxford University uh, utilizes their data analytics in such a way. And I didn't understand why in the beginning, but I understand why now, because you could actually see a stronger correlation. Sweden, no mass policy, deaths per million. Their case of million obviously have increased dramatically. Now also keep in mind too, what is the strongest nutrient correlated with transmission if that nutrient level is low? You recall what that is? Vitamin D. Those with adequate levels of vitamin D had a 57% less likelihood of transmitting COVID as opposed that was those were deficient in vitamin D. And so vitamin D actually had a stronger correlation than mask or distancing and so on and so forth. So we're entering the winter months. Yes, influenza tends to be a little lower. We're not really into that season yet. But however, though, as the sun begins to tickle the ray, less rays, I should say, hit the earth, people are wearing jackets, more clothing, vitamin D levels go down. And of course, what's going to be happening, if vitamin D is the strongest correlation in reference to infectivity or so on and so forth, then basically, or transmission, then guess what? Of course, you're going to have a strong correlation when the vitamin D levels are low, if those correlations hold, as opposed to masks. Mass levels, da da da. Mass levels in Columbia didn't seem to make a difference. Columbia, I remember I was picking random numbers there. Japan, again, a little lower there. Japan, Japan, I'm running through real fast. New Zealand, it looks like this, they just. Let's just throw on a mask and see what happens. And then they decided, nah, let's not. New Zealand, do do do. And that is cases per million. Again, this is a question to epidemiologists. That's a How can that happen in certain countries? I mean, is transmission just cut off that much that fast? So here we go. Uh, but look at their testing. Their testing is different. Uh, they're doing less testing. You see what's happening there? As opposed to cases per million. All right, so Finland, there we are. They said, let's, if you want a mask, throw one on. Going up a little bit of the cases per million. And here we go, test per thousands, cases per billion, and look at the correlation. Not a real strong correlation yet overall, but however, though, it's, it's getting up there in the number. India, again, you got to enforce it. But it's a four. It's like the United States. The United States is a, it's a, it's a mandatory mask. The um, the OWA data, our world and data displays. But however, though, you know, many you know many states don't require it, and so you really can't say four overall. So there's some confounding there. For those not familiar with confounding, they're basically kind of like elements that can uh, affect your data uh, unknowingly, uh, per se, until discovered. Then it's either a bias or you're evil. So just to keep on going. Test per thousand, cases per million. Spain, there's the, the mask. Again, see if there's any correlation. That's the, again, it's the, the timing. Look at October, November, December. It's, you know, there. Now I'm, I'm more of in the believer that the masks 
don't have much weight involved. In fact, I think the mask in some cases can be harmful, especially with retaining moisture. And I know they're trying to get people to exercise with masks. Let's say right off the bat in the very beginning, if you sweat in the mask, get sweat, wet, I should say, that does not help uh, prevent larger droplets uh, traveling through the air, potentially carrying things that you don't want them to carry. All right, Spain, there you are. France, mass level four, does it make a difference? I don't know, it's like a lucky rabbit foot. Because the reason being is all the countries are going up whether the mass levels are up or down. But however though, tests per thousands, cases per million, how many of those tests do people come out that don't have enough viral load to actually transmit the disease? That's the data I would like to know next. So without that, we're really kind of just shooting in the dark. United Kingdom, mass level two. Yeah, remember they were going up and December is when they ended a lot of their um, you know martial law type tactics except for wearing masks uh, and December 2nd when remember they started getting caught uh, manipulating the data and so they decided to say hey let's 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 end this ASAP all right United Kingdom again a uh, little difference there between tests per thousand and cases per million uh, again, I think when the media started looking closer at the data, it became more interesting. Italy, always worried about Italy. There's that. The mass levels going up and down. Again, they follow everything else. They're mass level three, and it still went down. Uh, there's again your test per thousands, case per million, and whatever that was. Oh, I know what that was. That was just another uh, pair plot. All right, so let's go to the next one. All right. We go into testing. And this is important because this is where our correlations come into play. All right, here we go. Going down, going down. Here we are. Correlation, we'll start with California. Starting to see a little bit of difference between the death and total test results. Our correlation still is 0.978. And again, it's still so strong, we can predict it. There is our uh, basically in ICU currently, basic da da da. As you see, it goes down and up. All right. Again, there's our ICU beds. We can merge that with all the data frame in the beginning with the health, health and human services, maybe by next week. All right. And because you'll find that a lot of the data is like all over the place. You have your basic data, COVID cases, so on and so forth, but you don't really have any data that's accumulated in one area this far into the game that can make it easier to, for an individual to determine what is working and what is not working. Everything has been merged and joined you have to hunt for it which is really the most disappointing thing about this whole pandemic a lot can be learned if that data was centralized someplace and it's still not trillions spent in that one good data analytic site that brings it all together all right proceed percent positive go on going forward go on, go on, go in there is our basically our, our death increase a positive increase yeah, so there's your death increase, the red, positive increase. You see that? How many of these cases do you think are asymptomatic? Because you look at that positive increase there. Look at your death increase. All right, positive to mortality. Again, you're dealing with two different axes here. So the, basically the red is the mortality, and basically the purple is the positive. See, 30,000, 160. So it just happens to correlate along those lines. And here we go. Total test results. This is going to be our data frame. Don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to that. Here is our correlation. If we were to draw the correlation between basically looking at test total test results to death, it's almost a you know at a 0 0.97. You're looking at a pretty steady slope. So much so, for example, let's do it this way. And you could actually actually want to run it again. You can tell. Well, I'll show you how this works. Never mind. Let's say, for example, we wanted to 269, 26,900,000 tests. All right. So basically, 26,900,000. What is going to be our estimated mortality? Our estimated mortality is between 20,857 and 23,060. Our current mortality rates right now, we've done 26,886,130 tests. 
and our current mortality is 20,847. So that means when our test hits 26,900,000, our slope model here predicts the mortality, predicts the mortality rate to be at a minimum of 20,857. Right now, we're at 26,886,130. So that is pretty darn close. And now the reason the correlation, you see the, you see your dates here? This is basically total test results divided by death. Look how those numbers barely move. That's why you get this extremely strong correlation, which you'll see in the charts in a second. All right, there we go. There we go. Let's just go to the heat maps because they're more fun. And do, 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 do. here's the United States, your correlations. But let's go to individual states. This is your correlation between total test results divided by death. Alabama, Oklahoma, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Arkansas, so on and so forth. So here we go. Alabama. Look at that correlate. I have no clue why they have such a strong correlation. Death to total test results. It's almost a one. That is weird. So here we go, looking at the heat map. Total test results. Death. That is just bizarre. And if we run it again, because I do a random heat map here, give it a second. There it is. Death to total test results, one. All right, going down. Alabama, there's our basically look at that for a second. Speed through. There's your correlations. Total deaths to total to test results. You see your correlation there. There's your positive increase, the death increase. Mortality percentage going down. Alabama of the heat map. If you look at all the things, your strongest correlations. You know, our priority is, is what total test results in death is one of your strongest correlations, just to keep in mind. All right, and then Oklahoma. Move through real slow. It's, it, see how the line just moves right along those lines? A lot of this, if you could put into a machine learning model, is pretty predictable. There's your correlation. Correlation. Mortality percentage per positive. It's actually pretty low. It just again, it's the way the chart looks. There is our heat map, total test results to death. Looking at about a one. North Carolina. There we are. Test press out. That again, you'll notice this a lot. You think, wow, that is an amazing, you know, parallel, almost parallel until they intersect. It is amazing how they follow each other. The objective is, again, to find out whether any strategies are working or basically is there a problem in the testing or particularly are we doing something wrong that actually may be increasing the cases. As we pointed in the very beginning, stringency index was correlated with deaths per million on a global scale. Again, there could be a lot of confounding involved in it, but however, though, it is now on their side to prove what they're doing is working as opposed to just saying, well, if we didn't do this, it'd be worse. No, that argument doesn't hold anymore. That's what science is for. It's basically to take away superstition. It's like giving someone a lucky rabbit's foot and saying, you know, our rabbit's foot worked between June and August, but then you weren't holding the rabbit's foot long, hard enough and now it begins to rise. Again, we could become emotionally attached to outcomes and emotionally attached to basically mitigation strategies but we have been able to be adaptable. You have to be able to change your way of thinking. North Carolina, mortality percentage, going down. There's a cheap map, total test results, death, one. Again, total test results contain negatives and positive. We're just talking total tests. So it's odd that the negative and positives on the total test results will always end up with the correlation of one. I'm still waiting for a good explanation to that, potentially the confounding. We've been doing this now for a few weeks. Still waiting. California. Pause real fast. I apologize, I'm moving kind of fast. Da da. Positive increase, the hospitalization increase. Look at that. Look at that. 
what is that? Uh, seriously, look at that. I know it's random, but look at that. All right, keep on proceeding. Correlation. Uh, positive increase to death increase. Mortality percentage. It's way down. And there's our heat map. Total test results to death, 0.98. New York, again, interesting chart. Death to total results. Did you did I mispronounce that? Total death to total tests. New York, positive increase to death increase. Mortality percentage. Regardless of the state, you have to look at that. Now, the weird part about it, deaths have actually been increasing per million. Uh, but however, though, the mortality risk overall has gone down quite dramatically. And we're going to check that in a second. New York, correlation, total test results to death, 0.96. Florida, which has very little uh, pandemic mitigation strategy in place right now, correlation. Uh, positive increase, death increase. Not like California. Interesting, isn't it? Where basically the lines almost mimicked, went right on top of each other. Mortality percentage per positive. Again, per positive. Think about that. That's, so it's still decreasing. Almost here. Interesting. Again, look at this. So that's something to keep in mind. All of them followed the exact same trend almost. They all basically, the mortality percentage went up and then went down at the exact same time the cases increased. So keep that in mind. There are basically total test results to death, 0.99. And who knows what that is, but I'll work on that later on. All right, let's go into the next one. Let's go to, we got to audit the world. All right, real fast. New cases move per million, new deaths move per million. Look at that jump in cases. Look at that jump. That is just incredible. But remember, we're talking the whole world. That's testing. Uh, we're keeping track. There it is. There's your rise in death. Mortality percentage of positive cases. Now look at this. Look at that drop. You see it right there, that one spot right there, but yet that at the same time correlates with that rise. You see what I mean? All right, let's go down, 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 down. Great Britain was locked down. Japan, Sweden, Sweden has been having a little bit of a rise. You have to look at that too. But again, they're not doing any worse than countries which are doing everything. Again, the objective is not to be moaning and see which country is doing better or worse. The objective is to see if the pandemic mitigation strategies are having any impact. And there we are. If I told you Sweden was had mandatory masks, lockdown, quarantines, and so on and so forth, you know, you'd say, oh, that makes sense. But if I told you they were doing nothing and still doing, I'd say, equally as well, uh, that's, again, for you to decide. And then your Asian countries, again, they have different habits and behaviors, which I think play a role, which we're not paying attention to, from diet to taking the shoes off, lots of things. It's not all about masks. Obviously, many of these countries have a higher population density and they do not effectively social distance. New deaths move per million, Sweden. New deaths uh, move per million, USA. Still higher. Sweden does nothing. Again, we're comparing apples to apples. Um, new deaths, Sweden. New deaths, USA. We'll scroll down, scroll down. And let's go to the next one. All right. Do, do, do. Do we investigate the correlation? Correlations. Here we go. Remember this. Let's run it through one more time. Just give you a quick run through. Now, this again, this is just amazing. I like this one a little bit better because it's easier to read. There's your stringency index, 71 to total deaths per million. Again, look at this if you want to. Uh, I'll see if I can get in this position where it's easy for you to see. There is that. So you can kind of make, you can kind of make it out. Pause the screen. Draw your own. Look at it. Draw on your own. I still, my favorite is female smokers and life expectancy, or at least above the age of 70, 0.77. Again, interesting. What behaviors do female smokers have where they're above, where they're correlating above being older than age of 70? 
about to proceed. All right, and over data, data frame, overall mortality rates. These are the countries with the longest life expectancy that was in the beginning. This is current case mortality now. So you, at the beginning, we used to say it's age. Age doesn't seem to appear to have any correlation. Uh, overall case mortality rate, that was in the beginning. Uh, this is in population density. So is the population density? No, doesn't appear to be any correlation visually. In fact, look at the exact opposite. This was these countries in the beginning. All right. These are the countries as of now. Think about that. Population density. All right. Total cases per million. Well, let's go scroll through this real fast due to time constraints. New deaths smooth per million. All right. The United States was at 3.6 when we first started this out. Deaths per million. It was last week was at 6.55. Now it is at. 7.178. I have no how clue how Yemen actually had people come back to life. But 7.178. You ready? Let's check it out. So let's see who is doing better than the United States right now. 7.178. Let's just do 7.2. And let's give a chart out here. These are all the people which are doing uh, new deaths per million better than the United States. So here we are. The United States is right here. Look, it is way up there. All these countries are doing a little bit better in reduced mortality. That's a better way to put it uh, than the U.S. per million. And there you are. All right, let's keep on going down. This is the chart, uh, you know, as far as breaking it down. And then world mass, COVID states. Let's look at this real fast. And I think that's probably about it after this. So let's go. So our data. South Dakota, again, look at the mean. You see how it goes up and down, depending on what day you report the news. It seems like the world is coming to an end. But when you have a low population, you have a much higher volatility. Uh, New York, Florida. What we want to focus on is Florida. All right. Let's get this out of here. Oh, what happened here? Have one second. Let me fix this real fast. I think what we're trying to do, we're trying to smooth the graph. Let's see which one this is real fast. Right, there we are. Positive per 100,000 to South Dakota all across the board. There we are. And this is death increase, so on and so forth. That is, do, 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 there's states. California, Florida, Georgia, New York, South Dakota. Again, focus on Florida because Florida ended its lockdowns. So we're using Florida as the control. Green, Georgia, wow. All right, we go through. Locations, looking at Florida, positive per 100,000. Florida's open. Again, we're using Florida as a control. Comparing it to California, New York, which have a very stringent lockdown. If you were a data analyst and you had to decide whether these lockdowns are working or not, what would be your conclusion based upon this? Deaths per 100,000. All right. And breaking down the graphs, charts right there. And these are the states, obviously, with the highest uh, mortality rates, so on and so forth. And I think that is about it for today. I'm not doing the uh, Monte Carlo anymore because it's all across the board now. We looked at the world mass, we looked at investigated, we looked at the, the COVID data per se, and we looked at the COVID states. The main thing we really wanted to add is we wanted to add the hospital occupancy uh, historically to give a good indicator as far as where we really stand and remove any biases as opposed to, is this the first time we've been here? Because obviously it looks like we've been there. We wanted to cover also the conflict of interest, recognizing a lot of people which are responsible for making decisions once again, the exact same errors we made during SARS COV-1, the conflicts of interest not being disclosed, which is kind of disturbing. Uh, the experience references the reference to the vaccines. Uh, again, there could be confounding here, not knowing what part of the trial the individual is on or in, whether in the placebo or not. But however, though, it seems to be a very common occurrence having a high fever as well. The four different types of vaccines being researched so if someone felt a little off in the RNA, could they get a whole virus, protein subunit, or viral vector, as opposed to nucleic acid versions? Yes, that possibility may exist. 
And then I think that is about it. The poly responses, policy responses. I reference the face masks. That's it. It's a long night. I hope you guys all enjoy. And Ralph signing off. I look forward to seeing you all once again on Tuesday. Again, any ideas, whatever it comes down to, be perfectly fine. But I really would be interested to know if you followed me this long, which vaccine, if you were forced, if you were forced to take a vaccine, which one of these four would you actually acquiesce to? Again, Ralph Trojan signing off. Gratitude. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you all next time. And if you need this information, I can put it on GitHub for you. Just let me know, and I will do it for you in a heartbeat. See you all later on. Bye.